Hello, everybody. Here we are on Monday and happy summer solstice. I know we missed it, but I have to say it because it is always one of my favorite days of the entire year. So here we are celebrating the beautiful long days. And I'm so excited today to welcome in our guest, Stephanie Rose from Garden Therapy. Let me bring her in so we can all say hello. Hey, Stephanie. Hi, Katie. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. Happy summer. This is so exciting. I know it's here. And you live in an area where your your summers aren't as long. Um, so mm. you guys must really relish in the, the warmer climates and where you can grow and things are blooming. Yes, for sure. I mean, this is this May and June time period is sort of the pinnacle. It's not too hot the you know garden isn't too dried out or overgrown and it's just like lush and green and full of flowers and colors and yummy things to eat it's it's heaven I'm in Vancouver BC Canada so um we have it's pretty temperate year round we don't have huge extremes in temperature uh but we have like the rainy season and then the not rainy season <laughs> Got it. I don't know why I always think of anywhere in Canada as cold so you get more weather like the Pacific Northwest yeah, exactly. It's exactly Pacific Northwest. That's where our, like our master gardeners group is Washington, Oregon and British Columbia. Got it. Yeah. Well, Stephanie has an amazing book called Garden Alchemy that is sitting in my bookshelf right over there that I should have grabbed, but here's a great picture of it. Woo! Um, <laughs> I always have a copy. Yes. And I should have asked you before, can we talk about your new book or no? Is it? No. Nope. No, there's no, there's no book. <laughs> um, well, no, there's a book. I'm writing it, but the manuscript is due tomorrow. So we're not quite at that stage where we're announcing it yet, but it's going to be amazing. I have uh, I have put my heart and soul into this one, and I'm so excited. Uh, spring 2022. So that's what's awesome. coming up. Well, if you want to keep up, if you love Stephanie's work and you want to keep up, you can follow along to find out when that book will be out on Instagram, garden underscore therapy, on Facebook, on all of the platforms. So you guys can follow along. We'll post the link right now um, to where you can find her so you can follow along when that book will be out. But you have an awesome book already. I mean, that book is amazing. It's beautiful. You poured your heart and soul into that one. So yes. And you know, your you're, it, it's a great book about growing organically, really, the medicinal benefits of plants. And so you really like, I love that you share with us how to do all kinds of things like salt, uh, sugar rubs to edible flower butters and DIY soil tests that I was, I couldn't remember how to do it. So I just grabbed some dirt um, out of my garden. No, soil, sorry, people. Um, yes, soil. Yes. And that's another thing included in your book and on your website and your channels is really about growing our gardens from the ground up and how we can make sure that we are starting there at the roots. Um, and basically your whole premise helps us live a better life. I mean, Marilyn saying she loves your advice and your philosophy. Thank you, Marilyn. That's exactly right. You, well, I'll ask you to share your story in a, in a second, but you help other people live their best life through plants. And that's why we love you. Oh, <laughs> so thank you. People who might not know you, um, would you just share a little bit of how you got into the gardening? Yes, absolutely. So it was uh, many years ago now, I'm thinking 15 or so. I was, you know, working in the corporate world, in an office, that sort of thing. I didn't garden as a child. I grew up in the city and I got sick overnight. I got, it's actually really interesting because what's gone on in the last couple of years with the pandemic and how life changed immediately for people around the globe, that happened to me, just one person. I got sick overnight, I couldn't leave my house. I was uh, confined to bed for almost two years. They don't know what it was that got me sick. They said it could have been an insect-borne illness, like not Lyme, but a tick-borne illness, something like that. Could have been a form of chemical poisoning or could have been a virus. So interestingly enough, people who are like showing the symptoms of something like a long COVID are is very similar to what I had back in 2016. So it took me two years to start, you know, getting well enough to do anything. But because I was confined to home, I just decided to go outside and work with plants and garden. I grew a garden. I got every book from the library on how to grow plants. And I would sit in bed and I would read them from cover to cover. And then I would go and play in my garden and just learn how the plants grew. And so it, it sort of snowballed from there. I don't generally do anything lightly. So um, for me, I started like, 
I started small because that's all I could do. I was severely disabled. So I started with five minutes a week. Um, but I moved up. There's a, uh, we should share a link later. Or if you go onto my website, and look on the about page, you'll see the transformation of my garden over five years. So it went from this dust pit that had nothing in dead soil into this completely lush, healing, tropical, almost looking um, space. So it was just, it was such a healing process. And it was then that I fell in love with plants, the natural world. And at the same time, knew that I couldn't do the work that was being promoted as gardening. So clearing out soil, bringing in new soil, bringing in uh, manures, uh, fertilizers, growing crops in rows, all that stuff, it just seemed crazy. Because when you go to a forest or a meadow, that's not how mother nature grows plants. Mother nature, like plants have no problem growing. We just gotta get out of the way as gardeners. And so as I did this, I learned just you know, not just how to grow plants, but I looked all the way back to basics to see how plants need to grow. And so I asked the plants for the answers. And that's a lot of what garden alchemy was about. Mm. So I became an organic master gardener. Um, and, you know, with the, the, the Vancouver Master Gardeners group here. And that's been about 12 years of working with children's gardens. But I also studied herbalism, permaculture, natural skincare formulation, I've done studies in all of these things. And, and I'm able to bring them together. To, because now that we see the healing power of plants, we just need to read them, find out what they have to say to us. And they've got some great messages, it gets really easy to read them once you once you take the moment to really listen, they're going to tell you what it is that they need. And we can just step out of the way and let our gardens grow. And then I think that's one part that gets people hung up is the, okay, I need to put so many inputs. I need to care so much for my garden. And then it's that second step of, okay, now I have all this chamomile. I'm growing chamomile this year for the first time because of you, our chat. Oh. But now I have all this chamomile. What do I do with it? So your book also offers, and your website, you know, you offer all of those things that it's not just that it's a beautiful flower and it's beneficial for our living beings outside, well, then how to take it and utilize it and take it a couple steps further. So that exactly. is exactly important part of it is not just enjoying your gardens outside, but even just being able to clip a bouquet of flowers if you're not growing herbs, you know, and enjoy them indoors as well. Yes. Well, people are always shocked when they see my garden because it's so full, has so many plants, like hundreds and hundreds of plants on a small urban lot. And it's constantly producing things. But I work on it very little. I don't really work on it. I just spend time with it. One of the things that I read in a in a book not uh, like many years ago, and I've tried to adopt this for my own life, is to just do a garden walk in the morning. So mm -hmm. get up, even if you're you know, still in your pajamas, go and walk around the garden. If you drink coffee, then bring your coffee with you and just have a look and see where everything's at. And it sort of gives you that uh, reintroduction every morning just to say hello, instead of you know spending your whole week you know, maybe at work and then doing that weekend warrior thing where you, you're out in the hot sun in the middle of a Saturday, toiling and you know just feeling like it could almost turn into a chore for me it's this uh budding relationship with a friend and yeah. and i just keep nurturing it on a daily basis rather than you know forcing it on the weekends when i have some time and, and that's such a zen practice too just to be out there and not on yes. your phone and not being bothered I and mean, we both have children and you know not that yeah. they're bothersome but just to be and bring them out there you know even if you've got oh yeah they're up for it um we had to wake up my daughter for camp this morning so it's like now it's <laughs> rude awakening but you know let them enjoy that process too and it is such a peaceful moment and yeah sometimes i'll spot like oh i want to go back to that and I want to, oh, I need to harvest my peas. Oh, or I need to weed that, that area. But it is such peaceful. Let us know in the comments if you guys, Heather's already telling us that, that she does. But let us know if you guys do that, if you have a practice where you go out to your garden in the morning or kind of what your practice is. Heather says one of the things her neighbors have seen her is at 6 a.m. on Sunday. So I think that that sounds like where you want to be and not that it's a chore, Heather. If I know you, it's not a chore. What an amazing way to start your day, though. Yeah. Like, yeah, Heather getting up at 7, 6.30 on a Sunday. I mean, you've got the whole day ahead of you now. Yes. I love it. So you mentioned, like, that's what garden alchemy is. But just because the word alchemy is is kind of old-fashioned, right? It's, it's it, it conjures up this wizard, wiz, witchy kind of thing. For me. <laughs> um, what does it mean to you? Well, I mean, the whole concept of alchemy gets kind of a bad rap because, um, 
you know, people think when they think about alchemy, they think about the alchemists of old who were, you know, trying to transform metals into gold and unsuccessfully did that. But alchemists were really uh, investigators, scientists that spent time studying the natural world world through observation mm. and experimentation and learning about how it all worked together. And the basis of a lot of science comes from that process of alchemy, but they did a horrible job of logging it. So <laughs> they really did because it was all cryptic. It was in um, code. And so people had a hard time taking a lot of what they were um, what they were coming out with seriously. So garden alchemy is takes that concept of investigation, curiosity, observation and experiments in your garden so that you get to know your own specific garden and plants. And it teaches you that same way where I read all the books and then I experimented with plants. It's all these little recipes, concoctions, experiments and ideas for you to go out in your garden and get to know it. So I could say, you know, Here's how you garden in this zone. Here's how you go garden in this zone. Here's what plants you should grow. Instead, this is your introduction to meet your soil, to understand how it works, to understand how the plants grow, to understand the pets and the wildlife and the microorganisms and the whole thing, how it works together, and then see how it res it, how it's working in your garden. So I can't say I can't unless I come to somebody's house, I can't say here's how you should grow your garden, but I can teach you how to read your garden. And that's a lot of what this is about. I love it. We're having people saying that they need to create a routine. And I think the best way to read your garden is like you said, going out there every day. And yeah. um, Tracy, maybe you need a copy of Garden Alchemy and figuring <laughs> out, like you said, I mean, I love your DIY soil test because for so long I had never done that. I didn't, I mean, I assumed that I had clay soil because when I dug into it, but you just don't know. And so that, that is the biggest thing is knowing, knowing your garden. And then you could have a garden like Stephanie that really manages itself. Yeah. So there's all sorts of soil testing. So you're talking about a soil composition test. I'll pull up yes. the picture in the book here. So I've got a couple of different ways of doing soil testing in your garden. And this is a soil composition test. So what you'll do with that jar of soil that you've pulled up. So yes. ideally, yeah, if you've got a mason jar, yep, that's great. And so you can test sort of the soil all over your garden or one specific spot. So say, for example, you've got sort of a troublesome spot and you want to see what's going on with the soil there or how it's composed, then you could dig up just in that spot. So you'll go down about six inches, get some nice scoops of soil and put it in the jar and then fill it up with water. You see, it's about three quarters of the way. Put a lid on it, give it a really good shake to mix that all together. And once it's all mixed together, then let it settle for 24 hours and then go back and check on it. And what you should see, and I think I've got, I don't know if you can see that, but there's layers. Whoops. There's layers there, right? So we've got, we're trying to find the layers of, um, the different elements and what percentage they are. We're looking for a mix of sand, silt, and clay. But if you have heavy clay soil, you'll see a big chunk of clay. And that means your soil will be very hard, poor draining, difficult to grow things in. If, you're, if your soil is heavily sandy, which you have a big chunk of sand, then all the moisture and everything is just going to drain through it really quickly and so you're going to struggle with keeping your plants watered so you want to try to get a really nice balance of those materials and try to get that loamy um, texture and so the, the funny thing about this is that okay so we're teaching you how to then find your composition and i write in here it's really great to get to know your soil you know if you have sandy soil clay soil but what you do about it is the same in any case you add organic matter so if your soil is too sandy, you add a bunch of compost, which is, you know, broken down compost, you can add organic matter like chop and drop, you can spot compost, there's so many different ways of adding organic matter into your garden. And it will start to adjust the composition. If you have clay soil, again, same thing, add organic matter. So it's quite funny, because there's all these soil tests that you can do, you can take soil samples and send them away to labs and get back, you know, the exact composition of your, not the composition of your soil, but you'll get back, you know, the, um, the, the nutrients that are available, any contaminants that might be in the soil. But in the end, really what you're gonna do is add organic matter. 
And so understanding it is good because it does give you that background. Um, and then you can test your soil again in a, in a year, in six months, in a year, and see if you're making an improvement, if you're noticing a difference in the plants. So, and I, I don't think there's anything, I'll just say, I don't think there's anything wrong with sending away for the university extension uh, soil tests. If you've got land that was previously agriculture land or could have some sort of contaminants on it, then it's absolutely worthwhile for you to go and you know get that soil tested to see if there's anything in there. Yeah. But again, Garden Alchemy has a whole bunch of ideas on how you can DIY this and learn about it yourself. Yeah. If you've got a regular home um, garden, then probably you can just add organic matter and, and grow plants and it's gonna start to remediate the soil over time. Uh, you could, I've got a pH test in here, so you can do a basic pH test with no special equipment, just baking soda and vinegar in your garden or in your from your kitchen. Yeah, and you can do a pH test and see if you're acidic or um, alkaline soil or where you fall on the spectrum. And then you'll just know better which plants to grow. I mean, I live in Vancouver, BC, so I know our soil is acidic, right? We have lots of rainfall and rainfall, that whole acid rain from that we were all terrified of the 80s. I mean, that just brings our, our, our soil up to a more acidic level. Um, so we just know, like we grow amazing blueberries but, and rhododendrons, but we struggle with some things that require more alkaline soil, which is not that much. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like it's, uh, it's, it's not... It's not, it doesn't have to be so regulated. Yeah. It's more just the idea of spending a little bit of time understanding it. And then you see why everybody says add compost to your garden. It's garden gold, right? There's a whole chapter in here on compost and, and why it's valuable. And because there's, there's really nothing better you can do for your entire garden, all your plants, all your disease problems, uh, all the pests. If you build good soil with some great organic matter and try to do it hyper locally by creating your own compost with your own microorganisms in it and then feeding your soil with that, then you, you can't not grow a great garden. Like it's impossible not to. Yeah, it's amazing so. where, I <laughs> where I've amended my soil in my garden. I go and I dig in that spot or I'm planting something new and it's filled with worms. But then I go to an yeah. area where I'm developing a new garden and I dig in that soil and it's hard to get a shovel in. And yeah. I see that it's cracked and dry. And how many worms mm. are in that soil? Very few. So yeah. it just shows you that when you are putting back into the soil and like you mentioned, not, not to mention taking out of landfills, you know, you're not putting those things in our landfills. You're creating it from yeah. the food and the waste right on your own property um, and if you can't do that and you because i never have enough compost homestead gardens has great compost options you can purchase these organic materials to add back into your soil heather is saying um there are plenty of plants that want to grow in sand so i do think there is is something to be said for knowing the type of soil that you have and then you certainly still want to amend it but you can also then like sun or shade you know, okay, well, I'll have, I want plants that are more drought tolerant or, you know, whatever that, that can more adapt to your soil. Do you think that that's important or should you just amend? Well, I think you should amend because the soil needs to, especially if you're taking away, right? Think of how the forest, um, the forest grows and meadows grow, right? The, the trees grow up they drop material down, it mulches the top layer of the soil, it gives organic matter, it breaks down, it feeds the roots, and this whole system. I think of, um, I just wanna say Heather's totally right, and I love what Heather said, that there's plenty of plants that grow in sandy soil, because the other thing is like not working against what you have. So if you've got sandy soil, you've got clay soil, you've got acidic soil, you've got alkaline soil, whatever you have, work with that, and it's gonna make your life a lot easier. So that's really smart. Um, but yeah, when I think about the forest, you know, I was writing this in because, uh, yeah, I'm really my brain is really going to this book that I'm writing right now. But one of the things that I was thinking about was the ocean. The ocean is this vast, mysterious, impressive, crazy place full of creatures that we don't even know of. There's some that are so deep down that we've never even met before. You know, so there's some of those crazy uh, climate events like like. Uh, tsunamis and things that brought up some of those deep sea creatures. So we got to see them for the first time, but there's a lot going on in the ocean. So when we think about the ocean, we know there's a lot living there below the surface and we don't fully understand it. And that's the same thing with soil. 
A lot of people just think of soil as dirt, that it's just this brown crumbly stuff that's there, but it is full of wildlife, microorganisms, um, insects, animals. There's so much that lives in soil. And for each you know, tablespoon of soil, there's hundreds of thousands or millions of, of microorganisms that are living in that soil. So it's really cool to think about your soil as being alive mm -hmm. and that we need to feed it. So your dry, crusty, parched soil, it's not alive anymore. And so we, adding some organic matter in there allows the wildlife to move back in and the wildlife are gonna do the job for you of turning that parched soil into beautiful, nice, fluffy, loamy soil. So people yeah, we, we do a lot of work that we don't need to. We just yeah. need to enlist these free helpers. It's like everybody understands the value of bees, right? Like they understand that we're gonna be out hand pollinating everything with paintbrushes if we don't support the bees. Well, if we're killing our soil and putting, uh, you know, a whole bunch of terrible uh, pesticides and things like that on our soil or herbicides on our soil, then we're also killing the wildlife that lives there. So we wanna try to support them and feed them and treat them like our, like our free workforce. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people often ask, like, how do I get the, the microorganisms, microorganisms in there? Is it like something that I can buy or add? And Stephanie will tell you probably, and I will too, they'll just come. If you build, yeah. they will come. Yeah. So I know we did this whole big trend about frogs a couple years ago. People are like, well, how do I, should I buy frogs? No, you don't need to get, buy these animals, ladybugs, you know, these, these good bugs in our gardens. Yeah. If you build the environment for them in your garden, they will come. Yes, you're so right. I mean, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, there was a little garden party that I was at and uh, I was a fairly new gardener and she was looking at the stems of feverfew and they were covered in aphids and, and the plant looked really healthy and there was a couple of stems covered in aphids and she said, oh, what are these bugs? And I said, oh, those are aphids. And, uh, and she's like, oh, I've got them. I, how do I kill them? And I'm like, leave them because the more aphids that you have to get to a certain level of aphids for the beneficial insects to come in. So if you're constantly fighting this little, you know, infestation of aphids, then you're doing a lot of work. But if you just leave them, and it's not like hurting the plant too much. And plus the fever few is a wild plant anyway, you know, so it's like perfect to have some aphids on it, then eventually ladybugs are gonna be like, hey, hey, guys, there's, there's aphids over there. Let's head over there and lay some eggs. So, I mean, you just, and the parasitic wasps will move in. I love in about a month, uh, my garden is filled with the little chickadees running around and eating the aphids. And I'm like, oh, my lettuce is like sparkling clean, not an aphid to be seen. So yeah, like just if you don't have these things in your garden, then you're not part of the ecosystem. Like yeah. you need, and, and it's, it's exhausting. <laughs> I'm just not into that kind of gardening where I have to do all the work. <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing to be able to watch it happen and mm -hmm. sit back and enjoy it and watch it happen. So, yeah. All right. Well, we also here to talk about perennial garden month and yeah. I am a huge perennial fan. I love annuals too. I have to be honest and not just herbs, but I like to decorate with annuals. So, but perennial herbs are my thing. I'm trying to find all of the perennial edibles that I can. So putting in my vegetable garden, all the berries and asparagus and then herbs, because talk about low maintenance, you know, they're the first things to pop up and then you get to harvest them longer so we're going to talk, because you are so into the medicinal properties, we thought talking today to you about some of those of your favorite perennial herbs to make sure people can add them to their garden would be great. So you, you said you have a couple that you love. Um, oh, let's just, I know, I know. So I'm, many. How do all. you choose? <laughs> Okay, well, the first one that always comes to my mind is rosemary, because I mean, it's a perennial for some. So I'm right on that cusp here in Vancouver where every four or five years, rosemaries will die because we get like one terrible, unexpected cold spell and it takes out the rosemaries. So generally what I do is I'll grow it as much as I can. And then I take cuttings every winter and keep them on my windowsill and then plant those out if the one dies or just you know give them away. But rosemary has so many different things that it does for us. It's not just that herb that we use in the fall when we're doing our fall cooking. It doesn't just make roasted vegetables taste amazing. Does it make just a delicious herb salt that you can sprinkle on eggs and uh, meats and things like that? Um, 
It also is a herb for focus. So if you're finding that midday slump around like two, three o'clock, you're not feeling like you have a lot of energy or say, I love this. I always recommend this to students is you grab a sprig of rosemary, rub it in your hands and just smell the aroma and it perks you right up. What? Yes, it's rosemary is the herb for focus. Every one of these herbs has like a little message for you. So you think about that like bright sort of medicinal smell to it. It's got that earthy pininess. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just rubbing a little of that aroma will wake you right up. Just like lavender looks so similar, right? Our, our French lavenders look so similar, but you rub them and then they give you that really calming and relaxing experience. So I also do skin care with herbs. So not just culinary, you know, everybody knows you how you can use rosemary. It's delicious. Um, but you can, it's also the herb for hair care. So if you've got um, like a dry itchy scalp, or you've got um, hair that's a little bit frizzy, it's really good to make dark hair shine. So I make a herbal vinegar with apple cider vinegar and a, some other herbs like lavender and uh, nettles and things like that, but with um, lots and lots of rosemary in it. And it just soothes your scalp, like no itchiness, hair's like nice and smooth and shiny. So, you know, there's so many things you can do with it in the vinegar for at least 24 hours or how, like the longer, the better? Longer, the better, like more like weeks. So you want to really infuse it in there for, for some weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really simple. Just, you know, get rosemary leaves, dry them and put them in with vinegar, like pack as many as you can. Sometimes when we're doing <laughs> this, some of this might go a little bit, you know, out there when we go into the herbalism, but the, you, you, when you do a jar and you're filling it with herbs, you really want to pack a lot of herbs in there and then pour whatever it is like vinegar or oil over top of it. So the idea is that you fill it up and you sort of press it down. It should feel like a fairy mattress. <laughs> I like sharing that. And then people are like, okay, I'm not listening to you anymore. <laughs> oh, no, you are speaking. My it's just cute. Language. They are constantly making fairy houses and they're using the knees <laughs> and putting herbs on them for the fairy mattress. So I love that analogy. Would you do the yeah. same thing if you're doing infused? So you said vinegars and oils, spirits, would you pack them in that? much too? Yeah, yes, absolutely. You want to try to get as much of those volatile oils out as possible mm. and really flavor it. So yeah, if you're doing a spirit, I mean, you want to get like yeah. a lot of really nice flavor. I mean, obviously, if you're going to have culinary, there's a taste component of it, right? So if I'm doing a vinegar that I'm going to not use on my skin, but I'm going to make a salad dressing with and I do that as well, I, I put fewer herbs in there because it's going to be overpowering. Mm -hmm. But if you make it overpowering, you can dilute it with more vinegar, right? So you can just do it to taste. Yeah. So you just shared this recipe for this. And I thought it was salt, but I'm pretty sure it's sugar, right? This sugar scrub. Yes. So you can do a sugar scrub or a salt scrub. Salt is a little bit rougher on your skin. So okay. if you're going to do it, I would like recommend a Himalayan pink salt or a fine salt and use it on harder places like your feet, never your face, never sort of tender, gentle skin. So I thought this is a perfect gift. I mean, I know we're kind of done with holidays, Mother's Day and Father's Day, but I think using your herbs now. So come Christmas time or holiday time, you are going to want to give people garden gifts. Now think about it now. You can yes. infuse, you can dry, start drying your herbs. So this is made, tell us quickly how this one's made. Um, which the, I can't see it on here. Oh, you can't see uh, it. I, I can't see it. <laughs> um, your on Instagram, it's this beautiful bowl of sugar and it's with rosemary and mint. Oh. I think you made a oh that's simple routine yeah that's so simple that's just you I've got a whole bunch of ideas for how you can do sugar scrubs but again it's like when I talk about the fairy mattress thing the reason why I talk about it is because it's to let you know that you don't need to have specific measurements of things soap making yes absolutely when you're making soap it's chemical process it's you really need to follow it recipes completely um lotions also because it gets a little bit more difficult but a lot of the recipes that I have you can just sort of put them together and um, something like a sugar scrub you need an oil and you need sugar and then you can add essential oils and herbs so that sugar scrub is with you know chopped up rosemary chopped up mint some I believe it's coconut oil I can't see it but I'm you know I make it with all different kinds of oils and then just white sugar that recipe because it's got sugar in it won't last it doesn't have any preservatives so it's not going to last until christmas time but 
I think it's really great to think about your herbs now because all of the recipes that I make are with dried herbs. Yeah. And the reason why is because you want that moisture out, moisture breeds bacteria. Mm -hmm. So if you dry your herbs and then infuse it into oil, you're not introducing additional moisture and you're getting just the good um, constituents out of the herbs yeah. to go into your soap making, your lotion bars and sugar scrubs and things like that. Yeah. So dry them now and when Christmas comes, you can make up a couple of jars of sugar scrubs and give them away to people. Yes. I love this stuff as hostess gifts. So in the summer, you know, things are opening up again. We are allowed now to have garden parties. So it's really nice to start bringing these things to people as garden party gifts. Well, and speaking of gifts, I just have to mention the uh, random, no, it, now it's not called random acts. What's it called? Random gifts of flowers. Random gifts of flowers that you did. And it was with flowers. So fun. Um, but you gifted, and you guys, you can do this at Homestead, grab, you know, you make your bouquet or you grab a local bouquet and then give someone the flowers too so they can plant that in their garden. And just quickly, tell, I mean, I'm going to cry if you tell me some of the stories that you gifted some bulbs to your delivery driver. Was it just your mail person or was it? No, I ordered everything I could think of and had eight different people show up at my house. I ordered my prescription, my groceries, my pet food. I, I ordered everything um, because I wanted, and I ordered some food from the restaurants that I loved that, you know, had been helping. So the idea of this whole random gifts of flowers was we did a series of them. First one, we went into a garden center and we just surprised people by giving them flowers. And I thought, you know, like we had a camera there and it, you know, it can be a little bit, you know, intimidating when somebody's just, and we've got masks on, right? Because like we're out in public and it's not the same as this, but we can't hug people. And so this whole thing is that, you know, we can't hug people, we can't share joy and kindness, but we need to spread more of this out there in the world. So there was this con this idea that flowers are the new hug. So just giving strangers these beautiful flowers and bulbs to plant in their garden and then asking them to plant them and use them as cut flowers so they give them away to somebody else and keep spreading that joy. It's the idea of like sort of blossoming kindness and uh, a little bit more joy in a difficult time mm -hmm. so we first did it at a garden center then I ordered all these things to come to my house and I gave them all um, you know something when they showed up they were very surprised I had like one on a bike and so he's like carrying the bouquet away on the bike one of the women um, she sat in her van and cried as soon as I gave her the flowers and then sent me a text message afterwards, which I couldn't share in the video, but she said um, that she had uh, just come through some really difficult, um, she had a, a tumor in her brain and she, it had just resolved. And then she got news that she had another medical condition that had come up and she's like a young 20 year old woman. And she said, she's never had anybody just sort of surprise her with something like that. And it meant the world to her. And so it's just, that blew me away. When I was at the garden center, I had, I asked people who they were going to give the flowers to. And some were saying that my, the teachers, the teachers that have been taking care of my children so that I can keep working so that we can keep supporting our family. Um, people who had lost people in their lives, like lost children. Um, and there was so much emotion that came out. It was very difficult to keep upbeat because I'm trying not to sob. Uh, and then the final one we did was amazing. Um, we went to to uh, give gifts away to give flowers away to the childcare workers. So we gave them bulbs that were already in vases and then bulbs to plant in their garden. And again, the childcare workers are just, it's amazing that they give them, they're putting themselves at risk every day, right? I mean, to take care of the children. Yeah. So this was a group that um, opened up their doors for emergency service workers so that they could go to work and somebody was taking care of the children. So imagine, you know, we've got all the nurses and doctors and respiratory techs at the hospitals, plus all the people in the grocery stores that are keeping us open and everybody who's doing this work and putting themselves at risk. And then the children are being supported by the childcare workers. So I, it was, yeah, it's very emotional. Um, but what I saw was this, desire to keep spreading that that kindness and so the more we do that the more I think we all get through this together I love that Heather just said um these are magical stories I'm not crying you're crying <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not crying you're crying oh yeah oh my goodness I love I that. lost my marbles a few times there <laughs> 
sharing that. Um, it, it is a beautiful way. Flowers are the new hugs. And who knows when we'll feel comfortable, you know, embracing. I have embraced a few people, but, you know, perfect strangers. And so it's a great way. And yeah. you can do that too. You know, it's not just Stephanie. You can share random gifts of flowers as well. Uh, yeah. And I mean, one of the concepts that, you know, that came out of this and that we did with flowerbulbs.com last year was to plant a kindness victory garden. So in the fall, we we're encouraging people to pl plant flowers that you could grow as cutting flowers. And then as those flowers grow, snip them, put them in a mason jar and just leave them on a neighbor's doorstep, bring them over to somebody who's got a birthday or just you know, that you want to say hello to that you that you miss. Yeah. It's a really, really great way. There's I, I mean, I love what's happening in in my urban neighborhood. Is there's so many little free libraries and small pantries and uh, seed boxes and sharing um, community, like within your community, so much sharing urban flower stands. And so you see just little mason jars of flowers just left out on a table in front of somebody's house with a sign that says, please take one if you need one. I know. I love this. It really has, I think, first we went really insular, just our homes. And then we realized like, well, we need community. Maybe we forgot for a minute how much we need our community. But this whole thing has really, I think, enabled us to remember how important community is. Yes, absolutely. And so when we were doing the introduction to me at the beginning, that was the whole point of me starting Garden Therapy is that I didn't start it so that I you know, would run a website when I started working again. I never intended to do that. I did it because I was isolated and alone and I was looking for my people. I was looking for that community. And thankfully there's, you know, what you realize when you start opening yourself up and saying, yeah, I, my life isn't perfect. I'm, I, I struggle and things are hard sometimes is that people come out and they're like, me too. <laughs> Can we talk about this? And you're like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We should be talking about this. We shouldn't yeah. be talking about the Instagram world of everything looking perfect all the time. We should be talking about how, you know, things are hard and, and we need to work together to get through it. And how gardening helps so much in that aspect. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we have a couple more herbs to talk about, although I feel like you and I talk about this all day. So yep. <laughs> you brought up chives, which I feel are, are such a culinary herb. So when you brought up chives, I thought, wait, chives can be used for, you know, medicinal purposes too? <laughs> well, chives, I mean, chives are more of our garden friends, right? So creating a border around the garden Ooh. to help, yeah, to help um, bring in pollinators, to help uh, deter other insects from, you know, going and chomping down some of our other, um, so some of our like more prized plants and they look beautiful. So I just, I mean, I make a chive uh, vinegar. Lots of people make a chive vinegar. It's got that beautiful ruby color. Mm -hmm. Chive flowers are probably one of my favorite things because, you know, you pop them off, you know, just as they're done blooming. Cause let the, let the, let the insects get their yumminess out of them first. But once they're done, pop the heads off and you put them in the freezer and then they're like great in soups and stews and all that stuff. So yeah, from a, from a like herbal skincare standpoint, I don't think there's okay. um, so like, anything. yeah, you're not, we're, we're not missing anything. I, I mean, I'm sure I'm you're certain that there's Asian flavor, or, you know, the chai beef bath. Yeah. Yeah, they're, but, they, but they are really great for our gardens. And so that's part of the, you know, creating that um, additional layer. They're so prolific and they make really great borders, creating that sort of bee border, right? Mm -hmm. Something that a lining along your garden bed that has flowers on it. So then when the bees are coming, they're like, oh, look at all those wonderful flowers and a mass of the same kind. So they know that there's going to be enough for foraging. And once they arrive, they're like, oh, Oh, and there's a zucchini. Oh, there's some strawberries. I'm going to go check those out as well because they're not as showy. <laughs> I love that. Okay, great tip. So chives. And speaking of sharing, I think that with these perennial herbs, I mean, during the pandemic last year, I went to a girlfriend's house, pick up some sourdough starter, and she had a plastic bag, nothing fancy, of lemon verbena. Just mm. dug it up out of her garden and gave me some to plant myself. And now, believe me, I have so much to share with other people. So chives are a great a great perennial herb to just share with your friends and neighbors. Yes, yes. And nature shares with us too, because you know we get a lot of lemon balm. So I, I love that you said lemon verbena because I grow both lemon balm and lemon ver verbena because lemon verbena is like that. Uh, 
lemon meringue pie lemon. It's so sweet and delicious. Where lemon balm is more astringent, like it's still a very, it's a very lovely healing herb. Lemon balm has so many different benefits. Um, it's very calming. It'll help, you know, sort of soothe your soul and help, it can help you go to sleep, but it's got that like fresh, bright scent that, you know, makes it great for um, making you feel really balanced. Um, in skincare, lemon balm is the herb for little red spots. So if you've got a cold sore or pimples or rosacea, like little red spots, then lemon balm is sort of known as that one that will help calm, just like it calms your soul when you drink the tea, it calms your body, it calms your skin as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I thought you said that because you saw the zit on my face, but... <laughs> 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 what about um speaking of calming in tea so i am growing my chamomile so tell, tell nice. us about so chamomile is it per, i know anything can be perennial depending on where you live it's a perennial herb for what zones do you know off the top of your head yeah not i, I not here but I it can be there. but yeah i mean i generally seed it every year i mean there's i there's some that some that can come back, but I, yeah, I'm really not in that zone where I can, I can I get it back. So I do see it. Um, but yeah, it's perennial in some places. Um, so chamomile is, is typically people think of that as the, the herb that you use with babies. So it is so gentle that, but it's not insignificant. That's the other thing is that chamomile is really a very healing. It calms a lot of inflammation. It can help you to know, have a sip of cam chamomile tea to help you go to sleep. I mean, that's all the way back in children's books, <laughs> Beatrix Potter, like books, they have little Peter Rabbit drinking his chamomile tea before he goes to bed. Um, yeah, so chamomile tea is is really sort of calming any sort of thing that's inflammatory and but gentle enough to use on babies. So powerful but gentle. And the beautiful, amazing apple scent of chamomile flowers is like there, yeah, there's just nothing like it. So you should absolutely grow it. The flowers and the leaves, or just in this case, the flowers. You can. So the other thing that I use chamomile for, um, so generally you're going to harvest the flowers for your infusions because it's got the most of the con like the the herbal um, constituents in it. So it's you you'll pop off all those heads and dry them and then store those in a jar uh, when they're dried and then you can use that for your tea and everything else. Okay. But I also um, chamomile is really great as an antifungal and it's been used as a, a dampening off spray or something to water your seedlings with or even a spray for when you get powdery mildew or things like that out in the garden. So all those like when the plants are almost done and you've got all those leaves you can steep those leaves in water in the sun make a sun tea strain that out and then use that to water your garden or spray fungus and um, you can amp it up because you, if you put in the dried flowers, but the dried flowers, uh, there's still some of it available in the leaves. So you can put the whole thing in. Got it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you said that I hear, I'd be over here, like doing the leaves and cutting the flowers for a, a bouquet. Yes. Oh yeah. And I mean, we are almost, we are like getting so close on time. You already mentioned lavender. Let's talk a little bit more about lavender since it is just oh. one of my, I mean, probably my favorite. Yeah, lavender is my absolute favorite perennial herb. I mean, I, <laughs> I I never really liked it as a culinary herb, but this year, I don't know what it is. There's something about this year, maybe just because we need that calming, maybe because I've been frantically writing a book, but I've been having a lot more culinary um, foods with lavender in it. I had a honey and lavender ice cream, which blew my mind. It's now my most favorite thing in the world. But lavender is another one sort of like chamomile where it's got some eucalyptol in it. So it's got some, uh, uh, some antiviral, antimicrobial, antifungal type components to it, which you don't think of it because it's very gentle. It's generally gentle enough to use on children, but it depends on the variety. So always test. Um, but uh, it's calming, again, for your skin, but very powerful as sort of protecting yourself. So I like to use it in um, baths because, I mean, you soak on your body. It can help to reduce inflammation. It can help um, sort of like calm down all your skin, but sends you off into dreamland in such a nice way. Mm -hmm. There's another... Um, you know, a lot of people will have like lavender in their eye pillows or something. I make a dream pillow with lavender, mint and hops. Mm 
and uh, you just sew it into a little sachet and put that in your pillow. And when you're sleeping, you can squeeze it to release some of the scent, but those scents just, um, you know, the, the traditional aspect of a dream pillow is to help you know, inspire your dreams and give you that rest, but really the aromatherapy that you get in your pillows is just very relaxing. And so you can also make take those little sachets just of lavender and put it in the dryer and use it as a natural, um, a natural dryer bag that helps to add a little bit of fragrance and freshen up your laundry. So in this really case, great for laundry to, you know, keep moths away and keep them fresh. In this case, with lavender in particular, are you using the flowers or just the mm -hmm. leaves here? So you're using both. Yeah, you, so you can use the leaves again. It's the same thing with chamomile, is that there is some of those herbal properties in there. The, some of the volatile oils are in there. Um, you'll smell it. I mean, you can pick the leaves yeah. and smell it. But the flowers have a really concentrated, a lot of people will, you know, use the flowers because of color. Yeah. Um, so what you want to try to do, it's kind of a tough thing when you've got your lavender out there. So you're you know, you're always kind of dancing around like, when do I cut the lavender? You want to try to cut it when the flowers are up and the buds have lots of color, but before they have opened. And the reason why is because that's going to have the longest lasting color, the most flavor, the most of the volatile oils in there. But if you don't let them open, then you don't get the, you know, the benefits in your garden. And so they're beautiful in the garden offers. So Try to do a couple of cuts, cut some of the lavender, let some grow, grow lots and lots of plants and sort of, you know, there's no, there's no right way of doing it. There's just always and try to do them all. <laughs> yeah. Lots of them all. So you have them. I mean, I know people talk mm -hmm. about letting your herbs go to flower because yeah. it changes the flavor, but in that mm -hmm. case, you don't get the benefits for your pollinator. So do it both. Have some of them go to flower because some of the flowers, I mean, sage, you know, some of the flowers on our herbs are beautiful. So you let them flower as well. Yes, and experiment, right? I mean, you can let some of them flower and then taste the herbs. You yeah. can smell them. You can see what the color is. I mean, I see a lot of lavender that's gone after it's flowered because, well, what else am I going to do with it, right? right. Like, I'm, I'm still going to use that. There's, you know, when, when, when they make olive oil, there's a first press, a second press, a third press, you know, and, and with herbs too. I mean, you can, you can infuse an herb in something and then take out those herbs and infuse it again. The second is not going to be as nice. It can be bitter. You know, it, it won't have the strength, the flavor, but don't waste it. Don't you know? so yeah. About lavender. Tracy's asking if it's also an insect repellent. She's heard it being used as that. I've heard that too. Like you rub, I mean, obviously um, what's the citronella on yourself, but is, is, have you heard that about lavender? Yes, absolutely. And you know, the thing about insects, and it depends on what insects, because every insect has different, you know, if you're rubbing lavender on yourself, it's, you know, bees are going to love the smell of that. Um, <laughs> but the idea of um, any sort of insect repellent is you're masking your own smell. Oh. So it's really, yeah, it's not that that um, mosquitoes are flying around, they're like, ooh, lavender, I'll pass. They, they're just trying to find humans, and they're just trying to find blood to eat. And so if you're masking your own smell, then, you know, then you're confusing them or they can't smell you. So yes, lavender absolutely works. I have a really great recipe on my um, website. I'm the kind of person who gets a mosquito bite and it turns into a, like a giant red whelp that itches like crazy and I can't sleep and it drives me insane. Um, I used to be that person, but I have a recipe for a roll on. So I have a bug spray with a bunch of different essential oils in it. And I have a roll on after bite spray mm -hmm. or after bite if you get a bug bite. So the, the idea is you get a mosquito bite and don't scratch it. You know that you've got it. Get your little roll on, roll it, wash it. If you're not anywhere near the roll on, just go and watch it. Get that saliva out of there. Roll it on and don't touch it. I know it's itchy. Just don't touch it. Don't scratch it by accident. Give it 10 minutes and 10 minutes. It should really calm down. Wow. So you're just removing the saliva and sort of neutralizing the, the histamine reaction that you're having. Um, and as long as you're not sensitive to those essential oils, it should do the trick. I need to make one of those for my neighbor. I don't want to rub it in, but I'm not one of these people that has a reaction to bug bites. Oh, I know. Yeah. Sorry. Everybody loves camping with me because, or going to like garden parties because I'm the one who gets bitten and they're just sitting there going, there's no mosquitoes. <laughs> my neighbor, it's not fair. My daughter got that gene too. So um, yeah. oh. she gets bit and it has a reaction. So I'll have to make that. We just posted the link. So thank you, Courtney. So we will get on okay. making that. I love it.
Um, oh my gosh, we've talked about so many great things. Does anybody have any other questions as we are wrapping up? Because we talked about the soil test. Any other quick herbs you want to mention? I know we covered so many things today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about dandelion. I know you probably don't think that this is a perennial herb, but it is. This is a wonderful perennial herb. This is, you can use the flowers to infuse oil and make soaps and lotions and beautiful skincare that's very calming. You can eat those highly nutritious leaves and the roots make an absolutely delicious, delicious coffee alternative or tea. I love roasted dandelion root tea. So these, and Yes, roasted dandelion root tea is so good. It's so like, it's nutty and oh, it just, it has such great flavors to it. And there's, you'll find in sort of natural food stores, you'll find uh, dark roast ones, different different varieties of dandelion root tea. So, um, okay, I don't know how much of this I can say, but the original word for dandelion is not like in French, it's like tooth of the lion because of the, the, the shape of the leaves. But it originally comes from, <laughs> the idea of pee the bed because it's a diuretic so you're if you're drinking dandelion root tea you know like it's going to help release your water you know it's going to help you feel a little lighter and so if you're getting that puffiness especially in the summer too with the heat it's nice to have a little bit of that tea to help sort of calm down the excess water that you might be hanging on to mm -hmm. and then yes and then one more thing that the reason why I talk about dandelion so much is because it is my favorite. And, and I talk a lot about this sort of thing in garden alchemy is that it's a soil fixer. So when people are constantly out there ripping all those dandelions out of their lawn, the dandelions are just, you're ripping out the things that are doing this great job of air. And then they go and they walk with the aerating shoes or they aerate the soil. But the dandelions are doing that for you. They're planting themselves where they need to be, where you've got all this shallowly rooted grass, turf grass, rooting down, picking up, mining for those deep minerals, bringing it up through the leaves and then dropping it on the soil surface so that it's feeding your plants for you and aerating the soil and supporting the soil wildlife. So leave those beautiful flowers in there. Let the kids make wishes and blow the seeds everywhere and just sort of, you know, kind of celebrate that amazing herb, perennial herb that we have growing in our gardens already and we don't have to do anything about it. Tracy's saying that her mother remembers dandelion salads with her grandparents. So, you know, these are the older things that we used to yeah. eat, you know, the whole Michael Pollan thing, like don't eat anything your grandmother wouldn't recognize. Well, yeah. your mother knows about dandelion greens. And then uh, Marilyn is saying dandelion wine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely you take the blossoms and make wine I haven't done it because okay. I haven't made a lot of liqueurs but I know there's a great recipe for it on uh, my friend Colleen's website grow forage cook ferment she's got amazing uh, she's sort of a teacher of foraging and wild plants and she does really great uh, meads and dandelion wines and things like that so check awesome. that out we'll have to check that out um and dandelion people are loving dandelions so I yeah i'm sure you posted on instagram a couple maybe like 10 posts ago of the this beautiful like yellowy when you said pee the bed i thought that's why you were going to say that because <laughs> very strong pea looking um color but that's and that's the photo i was i was sharing so you had infused the flowers and then turned it into that tea i suppose Oh, yeah. Okay. So I think because I, I can't see what you're looking at. I think you're looking at the big jar that I had full of dandelion blossoms. Yeah, I made infused oil with that. And if you um, look, there's a really, really gorgeous wildflower soap. So I used dandelion and lavender infused oils and made the soap. Oh, and rose. So it's dandelion, um, uh, lavender and rose oils. I think. Um, then I put petals on the top of it. It's just, it's the soap, the way it feels on your body is so amazing. It's got really nice light fragrance, but it's just, it's really um, nourishing for your skin. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like. It's that, that high mineral content, those roots that dig deep down. Again, this is how, you know, just we have to be curious about what the plants are doing. That taproot that everybody's like, oh, that taproot goes so far deep down. What's it doing? It's gathering things from deep down in the soil and it's putting it into the leaves and the blossom. And so that's making great wildlife food for bees and other foragers. It's making um, absolutely wonderful, nutritious leaves for us to eat. And it's making blossoms that we can use in our skincare that, you know, is nourishing for our bodies. 
Oh, I love these are why I love perennial herbs, and I'm so excited to talk yeah. to you today because they do so many things. It's not just a beautiful plant in your garden; it feeds your garden, feeds feeds your wildlife. You can use it in cooking, you can use it in medicinal, on your skin, inside. It is amazing. I love these perennial herbs, and I'm so we're so thankful that you shared all of this with with us today. Heather, who I know is a great gardener, said she's a better gardener for this session. So, oh yes, she. She loved it. So, and I did too. This was wonderful. Okay. You know what? I just saw pop in. I got a reminder. Okay. So remember I said I couldn't share my book that I'm working on. Yes. Um, it just went up on Amazon for pre-orders. So yes. So I can tell you the name of the book and, and people can like search for it on, on Amazon because it's ready for pre-orders already, which is I amazing. First time you're going to be hearing it here. This is the announcement. Okay. It just came in like seconds ago. Okay. It's called the regenerative garden and it's 60 practical projects for creating a self-sustaining garden ecosystem. So I have been working tirelessly on permaculture projects for the home gardener so that you can make a ecosystem in your yard. That's like my garden as no work. It sustains itself. And it's just a beautiful supportive place for our planet for our communities and for ourselves. So I'm really excited that, Garden. yeah. That. that means so much because it's not like you just said, it's not just about regenerating your garden, your soil, your plants, but yourself. So yes, and our communities. Summer. You said next summer? Uh, February 8th, 2022. I just see oh. the date now. Yay! You, <laughs> I knew it was gonna be God. like early 2022, but February 8th, 2022, the regenerative <laughs> garden. Friday! I love it. I can't wait. Put it, mark it on a calendar or um, we'll find that pre-order link if Courtney is tricky enough to find it and we'll post it here. Um, so that this has been wonderful. Thank you for yes. all sharing so much with us. And I want to see everyone's soil tests, but also you heard it from Stephanie. It doesn't really matter because no matter what you have, you got to add. No, it matters because we want to work with our conditions. We want to know what we have. And the more you know about your garden, the better you'll do. Yes, it benefits us to learn about our plants and work with them for sure. Thank you so much for having me, Katie. I always love chatting with you. I mean, I could we could talk forever. Um, but it's so nice to see ever to, you know, have questions from everybody and hear some of that great feedback. So thanks everybody for chiming in. Yeah. It's so okay. nice to be here. Already in their Amazon cart. So boom, boom, boom. It's gonna be a <laughs> bestseller by next week. <laughs> Yay! So exciting. Awesome. Well, thanks again. You guys follow along with Stephanie and um, it was great to see you. Have a wonderful yeah. summer. Yes, you too. All right. Thanks. Bye everyone. Bye Katie. Bye. And while Stephanie has to leave, I just wanted to remind you guys that we are back next Monday. We're here every Monday, June 28th at noon Eastern, and we'll be back to our Houseplant Monday. So Jasmine Jefferson of Black Girls with Gardens will be joining us to talk about houseplants. What else? We love them. And um, this is going to be our last one of the summer. So you want to add it to your calendar and please don't forget. So join us next Monday. That's June 28th at 12 p.m. Eastern. But for now, we'll say thank you and thank you to all of our Garden Rewards members at Homestead. Without you guys, this wouldn't be possible. All right. Happy solstice.